My name's Richard Longcrane. I directed The Gathering Storm, which originally wasn't called The Gathering Storm. It was called Frank, what was it called? The Lonely War. And Frank, what did you do on the film? I was one of the producers of the film. Frank one was of the, several. <laughs> no, Frank was the producer of the film, to be honest. We had lots of help from other people, but Frank was the guy that was with me from day one to day 5001. And uh, Depending on which day, it was either a blessing or a curse. No, it wasn't a curse. But anyway, Frank, you started this project long before I did, so tell everyone about how it started. I think the impetus was to explore a period of history and a man that everybody knows about and very little about personally. People know Churchill, the hero, the leader of the war. I don't think anybody really knew about Churchill in the early 30s when he was a lone voice in England, crying out again what, what was going on in Nazi Germany, listened to by absolutely no one. And I also think that he was a truly eccentric man. And again, most versions of films about Churchill have only been the great accomplishments, the great hits, as you were, of his life. So I think what Hugh wanted to do was to try to find everything about the man that we didn't know. And I think what you did so successfully, Richard, was to, with Albert Finney, show Churchill warts and all. The Hugh we refer to as Hugh Whitemore, the writer, whom we owe an awful lot. I have to declare that I had no knowledge of Churchill really at all. In fact, I, I think I can say it without sounding arrogant. It's not meant to be arrogant. I turned the project down initially because I had no interest in Churchill. I then heard that Albert Finney was going to do it, and I begged to be allowed back in. And thank God for um, HBO and, and Frank, because I was allowed another look at it. The opening titles, shot at the end of the movie, not at the beginning, and at a place, I think Frank reminded me, it was called Petworth. There was a big battle between, a big battle, there's always battles, discussions about not having a title sequence and banging straight in with Finney getting out of the car. And I felt you needed to deliver because it was such an amazing image. If we'd come in too fast, I don't think it would have built up to the expectation of seeing Churchill get out of the car. But we shot it on a very misty day. I think we had two days to do all those shots. and old Finney walking up the, the hill. That tree became an important image, didn't it, for us, Frank? Very much so. It's what was used in the poster, I think, in the end, in some places. Also, I think Churchill was so recognizable from his silhouette that the idea yeah. of getting him silhouetted against the sky was very effective. The battle sequence, uh, slow motion. Muskets were quite a problem because I wanted them to be very close together and the, those old muskets, they all fire all sorts of crap out of them and, and hot metal and, and so we had a, quite a problem getting them close together. I wanted to approach the film ultimately like the viewer, so I wanted to judge it based on what was on the page. And I think again the opening of the film was the most extraordinary thing for me because Hugh had created this wonderful sequence where Churchill has this dream, seeing his great ancestor fighting the Battle of Blenheim, which, again, in Churchill's mind, was a very glorious, one of the great moments of English history, and I think also for him encapsulated what the empire was. And then you cut very quickly to Churchill waking up this enormous fat blob in bed, paddling naked, into the bathroom for his morning pee. So within the first five minutes of the film, you just have no idea what's going on. And again, I think what you did, Richard, was to make that battle truly glorious. And the contrast with the morning at Chartwell was very, very strong indeed. Mr. Speaker, will the 30s go down as the decayed? Churchill, of course, was famous for stalking around the halls of his various houses naked. He would simply forget where he was and would wander in and out of rooms. And the staff got used to it as his various secretaries. But you never knew when Churchill was going to show up naked. Not the most attractive sight based on no. some of the photographs no. one seen. However, an interesting character detail. Granted, uh, self-government, it would mark the downfall of the British Empire. It would mark and, uh, and consummate the downfall of the British Empire. We were very lucky to get permission to film at Chartwell, which was Churchill's home during this period. We used several rooms there. The study 
where Churchill wakes up, combination study bedroom was completely recreated at Shepparton, but exactly from period photographs at the time. And I think even the, the objects on Churchill's desk from Chartwell were copied, as were the photographs and paintings on the wall. And his bathroom was very much... Bathroom was a complete copy, wasn't it? Yes. Exactly. It was a very small bathroom, minute bathroom. The household was always very chaotic, as you can see. We always have dogs running, people coming and going, to try to create the sense of the madness. Churchill's children came and went, would take up residence at certain time. Usually when they were broken, needed some place to stay. So you never quite knew who was going to be at the house. Ronnie Barker, who plays Inches, which was one of Churchill's various butlers, actually came out of retirement. It's the first time in 14 years he had agreed to do something on camera. That's right, Ronnie had been retired for a long while, and great English comedian, but playing it relatively straight in this. He loves comedy. He was trained as a straight actor, of course. Of course, both Churchill and Inches, his butler, drank a great deal. And apparently there was an ongoing battle on who was drinking whose whiskey and whose scotch. And Churchill also did a lot of work in bed. He would spend most of the mornings in bed writing and then eventually get himself together and go on to his various activities. Because you told her not to come till after lunch, sir. Your invention, I did nothing of the sort. You said you Very disorganized, chaotic, threw his clothes everywhere. A pretty hard man to live with. In fact, one of the reasons that I think Clemmie went off on her little sabbaticals around the world was she'd only take so much of Churchill and then she had to have a bit of a break. This is Churchill. This is Lamia. Good morning, madam. Something the matter. What's wrong? This is the dining room at Chartwell, which was designed by Churchill when he bought the house and extended it. And it's an extraordinarily contemporary room. Unlike the rest of the house, which is more Elizabethan and Victorian in character, this is quite a fresh-looking room, and I think it was probably inspired by his various trips to Palm Beach, which he took at this period. Mm -hmm. It has very much that feel of opening up to the view. I have to say, when I saw Chartwell, the first thing I said, let's not film, let's film somewhere else. It is so ugly, in my opinion. Beautiful place, beautiful setting, as you know from the movie. You know, Churchill said, I didn't buy the house, I bought the view. But he really did bugger it up. You know, he bought an ugly house and made it uglier. He put this room on, as Frank said, but proportions. You can see the windows are about three inches from the ceiling, so it's about 50 feet long, very strange proportions. It is a museum, so filming there was a nightmare. Please, let me wake up first. Where is it? Reminds me that Albert also broke up the language into a kind of phonetics, so he would take any of the dialogue that Hugh wrote for him and he converted into Churchill phonetics and he had to have that a few days before. People think that scripts are written months and months and indeed they should be but often you're changing stuff as you go along. Albert had to keep very much on his toes to keep the voice tone correct. Truthfully, people think that we just walked into Chartwell. In fact, Chartwell was made up of one room at Chartwell in the exterior. We then filmed at another house for the staircase. We built several bedrooms inside uh, the studio, the bathroom in the studio. Uh, and two other garden. practical locations for... Gardens were somewhere else, weren't they? The drawing room and the kitchens. That's right. They were on another location where we used the real rooms and changed them. So it was a real hodgepodge of imagery to get the style that we got in the film. But it's also was extremely complicated because you always had people on one set walking out of a door, and two months later they'd be walking into the room in a completely different location. The costumes, I was just looking at that um, wonderful dragon dressing gown that we had made for Churchill, which was something I'd seen in a photograph and we couldn't find it anyway, so we had to have it made and embroidered. It was cost a fortune, but when you got one shot out of it, it was very good. There you are, Clemmy. Did I keep you waiting? The exterior was Chartwell, which was, again, we thought we couldn't replicate anywhere. Don't you let him boss you about. He's a dreadful boy. Nonsense. Mr. Spee adores me. Churchill, of course, was always broke. He lost a lot of money in the stock market, was riding around the clock. But despite that, he lived extremely extravagantly, as you can tell from the cars and the large staff that he seemed to be under his employ constantly. Yeah, he was always stretched for money, never had enough. This scene, I mean, we shot this, and we wanted to go back and do some more, and we had to... Some of these shots are shot in the studio with moving green screen plates behind. 
trouble was that the leaves had gone off the trees by then. We couldn't shoot a plate. I'm sure audience will understand about this. In fact, I think the shot we're looking at now is a fake green screen. So we actually went and shot the forest with all the leaves off and then tinted the whole shot sort of green and brown. And it seems to work pretty well. But it was a nightmare when you go back. One of the great things about HBO, I have to say, as a director working for them, is they always keep a bit of money up their sleeve for doing some additional shooting. I've made quite a few movies in my life, and, you know, what I shot was what I had, but what we did on this film and what we've done on the next film for HBO was to actually look at the film, cut the movie, and then say, well, OK, what would we like to put into it? And that's an enormous asset to any director. The period shots of London were tricky to get. I think we were told we could go between 5 and 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning to completely control the traffic. And actually, from the angles you chose, Richard, the House of Commons is pretty much unchanged. Pretty clear. It was some scaffolding we had to take off in CGI computer graphics. But we're now looking at the interior of the House of Parliament. You know, this is um, the main room. And that was built by Lucci as a set. I think the other thing that distinguishes the film is when we were looking for locations, what happens with period films is that people usually tend to find very pristine period locations. I know when we were looking for the exterior of Fleet Street, for example, when Clemmy goes to visit the accountant, you wanted a combination of architecture. So you chose a street which actually had that great 1930s building as well. It was a newspaper office, but it had been built, I think, two years before our film started. So it would have been a brand new building. We used a tube station. I didn't want the film to... The tendency with sort of English period movies for them all to be old-fashioned, but, you know, everyone had antiques, the Romans had antiques, the Egyptians had antiques, so, you know, we don't want everything in our movie to be of the same period, so we had new stuff and old stuff in the film, which I think helps to make a back environment in which the actors feel realer. We had heard when someone had previously tried to negotiate with the family for some of the rights for speeches, whatever, and the lawyer came back and said, by the way, it has to be gross, not net participation. And everybody was very curious why he was insisting on that. Was it the family? said, no, no, this comes from Winston himself. The lawyers for the producers were rather thrown. They said, what do you mean it comes from Winston himself? Has there been some sort of seance? Are you communicating with the dead? They said there was a letter from Clemmy that Winston had written after he had taken a trip to Los Angeles. He was having dinner, I think it was with Jimmy Stewart, and Jimmy Stewart had advised him, if anybody ever wants to do anything on your film, your life, you must insist on a gross participation. So they had documents dating back from the 50s in the record, and they used that to make the deal for all of future film rights. What did he say? He promised to cut down to three bottles of champagne in the evening. I'd assume that Churchill, I think like many people in this country, was just a kind of bully, a bully that was necessary at that time because they had a bully, so we needed a bully. But Churchill was a multifaceted man. I mean, he was, he was full of angst and pain. He was a depressive, but he was a genius. He got an awful lot wrong before the war and afterwards. But what he really got right was this period of his life witnessing my own demise. Morton walking across the hill here, this is actually shot in the... We had a very late summer, this is shot in October, but we just about get away with it with the leaves on the trees. You had worked with Jim Broadbent before, hadn't you? Uh, done a couple of movies with Jim, yes. A great, wonderful man to work with. Effortless, he just comes on. And you think, well, in rehearsals, first rehearsals, Jim will come on with a silly voice and you'll think, that'll never work. And by God, the time he's put it together on film, it's immaculate. He really does become somebody different than every film he makes, I think. Black Dog Day, we're relying on you to shake him out of it. He came really? back from London in a terrible mood and he's been like that ever since. The Black Dog and the pigs. Yes, Churchill really did keep pigs and he go down and sit there and in one of his sulks and watch his pigs. Winston. Apples, eating apples. It was a wonderful noise, I thought, the apples. That idea came from being down there and finding an enormous pile of apples from an orchard, and I thought, I wonder if pigs will eat apples. So we, of course they do, and we put them in front of the pigs. So we've got this great, you know, we've got this the greatest man, in, as it were, in modern contemporary history, perhaps, sitting there staring at a fat pig eating apples. Pretty incongruous scene. Hardly. I found over the years that taking a scene that a writer has, has set in a fairly straightforward environment and then putting it in a slightly different environment 
for example, a love scene that's been written to play against a lake with swans, you know, a romantic scene, a proposal. You take the same dialogue and you put it on a freeway, a motorway, in a rainstorm with a flat, with a puncture, and they're changing the tyre, and they're playing the same scene. It seems often works. It's a cheap trick, but it often works. And I, I did a bit of that in Churchill. Come and have some lunch. Not hungry. Everyone's waiting. Let them wait. He was a mixture of emotions. He could be so rude sometimes and so dismissive, but then he would suddenly run in with a bunch of flowers for one of the girls, or when Mrs P, the secretary portrayed in the film, was very ill, he wrote this beautiful, touching letter to her saying that, you know, she would be looked after and not to worry about anything at all, and yet he could be so brutal at times, a real dichotomy as a human being. What is all this? Report from our air attaché in Berlin. We decided to not use the gardens and the grounds in any close shots at Chartwell because, of course, it's been a National Trust property and is manicured within an inch of its life. And at the time, Churchill had the house. It was a working farm where there was livestock, where there were these vegetable gardens. So we went to find a much more ramshackle, slightly deteriorated working garden and farm area for Chartwell. And as you can see in these scenes here, this is actually a vegetable garden that is still farmed by the owners of the property. And we thought it was much more characteristic of what Chartwell would have looked like at that time than the very manicured set that now exists at the National Trust property. This is one of my favorite moments in the film, simply because I think you've got three of England's greatest actors appearing in this very short scene. Sir Derek Jacobi playing Stanley Baldwin. You have Tom Wilkinson, who was also nominated for an Academy Award last year, and of course Linus Roach. And the fact that both Tom Wilkinson and Derek Jacobi agreed to play these very small parts, I think was only a credit to their desire to work with Richard, but also the strength and material. But again, it's, it's a great treat for people who admire these men to see them in this really wonderful scene together. Then, of course, the icing on the cake is at the end of the scene, Jim Broadbent appears. Thank you. So was... again, within this five minutes of film, I think you have four of England's greatest actors. Perhaps you will let me know the results of these inquiries. Most you also have a slight problem we encountered here in that the German actor on the right, the taller one, talking to Linus, we didn't actually, we cast him, we looked at him, but we didn't know quite how tall he was. He was six feet five. Six feet five, and Linus is about five foot six, no more than that. And so when we actually got them on the day, they looked ridiculous, perhaps, standing on the steps. Linus was staring, I think, at Walter's navel Just for most about. of the scene. So, in fact, optically, that shot, we raise Linus up. When they're on the stairs, it doesn't matter so much because you expect people to be different heights on stairs. But as they walk down to the floor, we actually move Linus up. We make him taller so there wasn't such a marked difference. That was uh, interesting. So for 30 seconds of film, Linus Roach gets to be six foot one. He does, or six foot anyway. <laughs> or the top hat, yeah. Nothing but bully boys these damn marches. Well, they get away with it, that's the trouble. Nobody does anything about it. That's right, they don't. One of the problems with filming very in these, this was um, yes. uh, the clubs that we, some of the locations we filmed in were very hard to get permission to do. The famous gentlemen's clubs in London. I'm sorry, have we met before? I'm, I'm terrible at faces. They like a bit of filming, but only in very specific times, so you can't afford to drop behind schedule on location pictures in London if you're using a difficult location. Every day is a nightmare. We also like the crew to show up in a jacket and tie. You had to wear jackets and ties to shoot. <laughs> jacket and ties to shoot. This scene was actually the first scene that Hugh Whitemore wrote. He said once he had gotten this scene written, he felt that he could write the film. I think she wants to do it professionally. For him, it encapsulated everything about oh, Churchill, people. the character, Clemmy, and also the relationship together. Then, of well, course, it ends with this wonderful family. scene when they go and they take a look at the view from Chartwell. Do not become chorus girls. And I think for all of us, it was one of the, the great thrills watching this scene filmed because okay. Albert and Vanessa were so extraordinary oh, together. You've forgotten the cake. There isn't any, sir. That's what I'm telling you, city girl. No, we don't have any cake, Winston. That's what she means. Don't have any cake? Of course we have cake. Dundee cake from Fortnum's. Thank you, Peggy. Yes, ma'am. It reminds me that Albert, Albert stayed in character, not in an obnoxious kind of method acting way, but he would, he would give me a bollocking if he didn't like something I'd done as Churchill. Four queens. 
And I would say something back to him, hopefully not nearly as witty as he was, but I'd give it my best shot. I wanted to see exactly how bad things are. Could be worse, that's the answer. We've got the most enormous... Age. He's a great wit, Finney, very funny and sharp man, and a joy to direct. For God's sake, Clemmy, I'm working day and night. All these articles for the Evening Standard, Marlborough, not to mention the constituency work. I know, that's why we have to economise. It's like depriving me of my Dundee cake. They, of course, couldn't play Bezique. It was a very obscure game that the Churchills played, and they studied for weeks. They came to the set thinking they knew it, and, of course, once we started, they lost track completely. I think it was a nightmare editing it. I think everybody had the wrong cards at the wrong time. Completely, but what was interesting, Frank, is that it actually helped the scene because Albert was getting a little irritated with Vanessa because she was doing very well, but she was getting her cues with the cards wrong. And what it meant was he got tenser and tenser with her, which made her get more and more nervous, as she's meant to be. So it produced a chemistry in the scene that I think is one that makes it one of my favourite scenes. Yes, I think that Vanessa was afraid, as Clemmy was, that Albert was going to bite her head off if she played the wrong card once more. And there's some wonderful ad-libs in this scene, I think, actually, as you say, when he was very irritated that she wasn't playing properly. I didn't like it, and you deliberately deceived me. That's not true. We invited Lady Soames and her son and daughter, and we also took Winston's grandson, Winston, into the editing room, and we actually showed them a scene where Clemmy and Winston look at the view from Chartwell. Much to our satisfaction, we turned around at the end of the scene, all the Churchill family were weeping. So we knew at that point that at least in terms of Albert and Vanessa, I want to show you we had gotten it very right indeed. I'm not. Come with me, please. We had a rather ironic situation. Of course, Chartwell has one of the most beautiful views in all of England. That's why I bought it. The day we were shooting, it was completely fogged in. We went back on four different occasions, and we could never get a decent shot of the view from Chartwell. So we ended up having to use a different picture, which we tried to make look like the view at Chartwell. The view from Chartwell is made up from about five different photographs that we stripped a new sky in, foreground was different. We could just never get the view from Chartwell photograph properly, so we had to make it up, sadly. Look at and to cherish for the rest of our lives. I would die for it. <laughs> this was actually shot at Somerset House. We had permission to shoot the exterior of the Foreign Office and the interior of the Foreign Office. We had reached agreement, I think, last August, and the Foreign Office had given a special permission based on the script. Then, of course, the events of September 11th happened, and suddenly we were denied all permission. So fortunately, we did find some exteriors in London that were very similar. God Almighty. Designed for civilian use, I'm told, but we both know they can be used for fighter planes. This is total madness. In the back of our mind, thought it would have been extraordinary to actually have shot the scenes that took place in the foreign office. It was a great shame, in fact, with enormous strain on the production to find these new locations. Which reminds me, looking at this location, you can see how there's a grey, dirty colour to this building now. Well, in fact, of course, all the London buildings now have all been cleaned and they're white, basically. I mean, they've got back to new buildings. At that time, they would have been covered in soot from the coal fires and uh, from London for all the London houses. Our effects supervisor, Angus Bickerton, had the task of painting the buildings black because, obviously, at the period that we made the film in, the buildings were all um, black, and, of course, today they've all been cleaned and they're white, so it looked authentic. Try telling that to Mr Hitler. Well, then why doesn't the government do something? They don't want to provoke another war. Who does? And they feel guilty. About what? This house was down on the river. Beautiful old house. Robbed the Germans of their self-esteem. He's tired out, man. I'm getting him ready for bed. Thank you, Ed. Should we go up? Mr Baldwin believes a strong Germany will keep Russia in its place. The government regards the communists... There was a very delicate moment in the film where the couple played by... Linus and Lena Hetty, the characters they played had a son with cerebral palsy. And Richard very much wanted to find a child who had this ability to play the part. And much to the credit of our casting director, Irene Lamb, she went to four or five different organizations throughout the country that treated children with a specific disability. Those with pure Aryan blood are the man gods. 
And she found this absolutely remarkable child who, incredibly bright, understood absolutely everything that was going on, had a great time, but as you can see from the film, had some severe disabilities. He's a magical child, and Richard rightly felt that no actor, especially a child actor, could sort of capture the pathos and the reality of what the little boy brought to it. He loved filming, he just loved doing it, and he would give me a really hard time and tell me I wasn't doing it properly. But he, uh, and he was pretty right the most of the time. But he, he knew, he had a great insight into what he was doing, and he produced a warmth on the set that was, was very helpful to everybody. Everyone loved it when he turned up. What part of Germany are you from, Herr Baron? Bavaria, some ten miles from Munich. This is another example, I think, where Richard departed from the norm of period films. On holiday? This dining room was a famous dining room designed in the late 1920s, Eltham Palace. And as you can see, for the 20s, it was the height of fashion, sophistication, and art modern. It's a great contrast to Chartwell, and we thought it gave this part of the film a rather contemporary feel for that period which, again, you don't normally yeah, see in films of this sort. Yeah. Please don't interrupt me when I'm trying to interrupt you. <laughs> Herr Schroeder, have you ever seen Herr Hitler? I've met him. Really? Uh, when was this? Quite recently. I was having dinner with friends. Hitler was a principal guest. What's he like? My first impression, insignificance. It was a tough day. That shot where we move over the table. Well, the only way to do it was to have two dollies on either side of the table with a scaffold rig going across the top and track slowly in. One dolly grip couldn't move as fast as the other one, so the camera kept veering off slightly towards one of the side guests. Out of Parsifal, he said. I shall make a religion. His oily hair fell into his face when he read it. And again, this is another National Trust and property. Immediately out of frame, there are dozens of curators watching nervously. When we went there on this film, we had to be very careful. Nothing was allowed. We had to put a glass top over the original table. It's in the middle of the room. Very tough day, this was. Nobody moved. Nobody spoke. We all sat in silence. Rather like this. Now, this is interesting. This is what's called the factory, which is a filing room. It looks like it's a nice inside, exterior, sunny day. In fact, this was shot in a tent that we put up on the edge about 50 feet in the car park of Chartwell because we were filming in October, November, and the shooting day is really from about 9.30 till about 3 o'clock. Well, we didn't have enough money to stop filming at 3 o'clock and make the schedule another four weeks, five weeks longer. So we had to keep working, but we had nowhere to go. We didn't have enough night shooting, so we actually built an exterior that was meant to be looking out to a daylight in a tent. In fact, it was pouring the rain when we shot that scene. You never know looking at the film now, I think. Order! You have dictatorship. That's grim dictatorship. Excuse me. You have the We had a wonderful parliamentary advisor, I think, Chris Pond, mm. who told us fascinating things, one of which he told us that the House of Commons was completely filthy, that the members would always tear up papers, and by the end of any session, it was six inches deep in litter. They were incredibly rude and boisterous. There were certain things they couldn't say, but they were very badly behaved generally. And as you can see, we tried to capture the feeling of what it was like. That's right, and you'll see down this shot, you see that red line that they've got their toes on? Well, that's where the expression towing the line comes from, because the opposition party sits on one side of the house and the incumbent government on the other side, and no one is allowed to step past that red line because it is, in fact, two rapiers' widths wide, so that if you pulled your sword out, you couldn't actually attack the other member, and that's why it's called towing the line. So we learned a lot of interesting... And I think, actually, the... This was instituted after someone was killed. That's right, it was. In a sword fight on the floor of the House of Commons. May I remind the right honourable member that a poll conducted by the League of Nations found that over 90% of the British people favour international disarmament. One of the problems with doing movies is when you've got lots of small parts where you require great actors. 
we were very lucky to persuade many great actors to come in and just do small parts. It's quite unusual. So we got lucky. I think Albert and once we got Albert and Vanessa and had a, a head of steam and Jim joined us, and then we got fairly lucky. The scene in Churchill's painting studio was also shot later. We had finished the film and felt looking at it that there was a key moment missing, which was really Clemmie's ability to talk Churchill out of his depressions. She seemed uniquely gifted in this ability, and we felt that even though it was inferred, there was a moment missing. So again, with the blessing of HBO, we, in January, we assembled Albert and Vanessa and the rest of the cast and our crew and did this scene and a couple of other scenes. Albert, Amazing how he slipped back into the character, didn't he? Almost like he just walked off the set and come back in again. I think he was most upset after having shaved his head in October and I think beginning to regrow his rather luxuriant head of grey hair to find that he had to shave it again in January. He wasn't happy. And all the other heroes, stupid nonsense! If you give up now, then you'll never know. He took on the qualities of Churchill that I'd read about, obviously all the film we looked at and the videotapes of film from that period. He had become Churchill to me so much, and, and that really was quite a shock. He did it without any prosthetics at all. When I met him in the early days of meetings, I rather dangerously said, well, I you know, asked him, would you like to wear, you know, what are you going to do? Well, he shaved his head. Albert shaved his head completely and wore a wig, which was a kind of semi-bald wig, which, was, which helped enormously. Many actors wouldn't go through that, but he did. No prosthetic work, no rubber work on his face at all. It was entirely done with his body language. He did, in fact, bring his head down into his neck quite a lot, compressed it up, which was quite painful for him. Winston, all these years I've put up with the miseries of political life because I believe in you. And somehow I survived to have you here all the time in retirement, bad-tempered, getting in everybody's way. That is something I just could not survive. <laughs> You're getting pretty good at this, Winston. Mm, Albert went to bricklaying school for a couple of weeks. He did. He was uh, a terrible bricklayer. He was, he was, he was terrible. I think, worse than, worse than it Churchill. Seemed, it was very easy in theory, but he tried to explain to us how to do it, and it was much more complicated. But fortunately, Churchill was a bad bricklayer, so Albert's inability to master it served the scene well. There's a bit of misdirection. It's, if you actually watch this scene, this is the first, first scene we shot, second scene? Uh, first scene we shot. First scene we shot, this one here, of the whole movie. The bigger stars are, the more nervous they get, and Albert was very nervous on this day. And if you actually watch him bricklaying, he, he's doing it completely wrong. He's got his hand upside down, he's putting it on the wrong end. But you don't notice it because you're so listening to his voice and watching his face, you don't see it. But it's worth looking to see how bad he was. Russell, Desmond, you need to fight back. Come in. Again, this is the Foreign Office. We'd lost these locations and we ended up filming oh, really? in an abandoned, derelict... Well, in an out club. In an out club, that's right, on, on Piccadilly. Really? Wonderful building. And much to Lucy's credit, I think we had lost the location and had to shoot here and got the whole thing done in three days. Three or four days, yeah, it was amazing. In effect, the compulsory sterilization of all those suffering from hereditary illnesses which are deemed, and I quote, to affect the health of the nation. I was fascinated to learn that at the time that Churchill was trying to make the British public aware of what was going on in Nazi Germany, that 90% of the public were adamantly opposed to any sort of action against Germany whatsoever. It's German domestic policy and has nothing to do with us. They were so scarred and traumatized by the First World War that despite what was going on, they simply couldn't envision the idea of another war. You, on the other hand, may think otherwise. Have you brought any of this to the attention of the government? This is the point in the movie where everything starts to change. Briefing notes to Mr. Baldwin and all members of the cabinet. It's a fascinating scene because Rafe Regram's boss, a man named Robert Vansittart, was in a curious position. He knew exactly what Rafe Regram was doing and planned to do in informing Churchill. At the same time, he had to appear as if he wasn't sanctioning it. But with his indirect blessing, this is the moment that Rafe Wiggum decides that he has to somehow let the British public know what the government is keeping secret, the extent of the Nazi rearmament. And it was an extremely brave thing for this man to do. 
And of course, he happened to go to Desmond Morton, who was one of Churchill's great friends. The figures are very precise, much more so than the information I have. Presumably, you have access to other reports, other statistics. All of it is as precise and detailed as this. Far more detailed. As I say, this is only a summary. Well, I don't see how I can help you. Well, your position. I may be called director of the Industrial Intelligence Center, but don't be fooled. So through, again, this very small world where people seem to know each other, Ray Ingram got to Churchill and pretty much, I think, completely changed Churchill's ability to make his case. I think you should talk to Winston. Winston. In fact, Wigram is one of two people Churchill mentions in his memoirs who was most significant in bringing him the information that he needed to go public. Now he's back with the Tories again. He has no judgment. Maybe. He has an extraordinary instinct. He knows when something's important and should be pursued. He's wrong about India, of course. What was also interesting is that Wigram was the ultimate civil servant. He was incredibly honest, and this is a very, very difficult thing for him to do, but he knew that what was really going on in Nazi Germany, he knew the government was for what they thought were good reasons, covering up the information. I think the thought was the government realized if they revealed to the British public exactly the extent of German rearmaments, they would demand they do something, and the British thought they were not ready to go to war over this. Criminal act. But perhaps a necessary one. Marjorie? Yes, Mr. Wigram? Uh, an envelope. I need a, a large envelope. I mean, this film becomes uh-huh. more and more pertinent every time I see it, really, in terms of the present situations that we find ourselves in with governments. You know, it makes me realise how little control we have of our destiny politically and how whatever information that is fed to us, we believe. And at the time, for better or worse, governments believe they should not let the public know too much information. I think that was very much the case in the Second World War, and I suspect it's probably the case now. We were very pleased because when Lady Soames viewed the film, she was thrilled that we had actually painted Rafe Regan as heroically as we did. She had felt that he had not been given the due by historians of the period. There were other people who essentially made much more significant contributions, but she had felt, as other historians do, that his connection with Churchill was absolutely vital. It's a swimming pool we use. We tried to, again, to open it up. I mean, we could have just shot this scene. All he does, he's meeting Morton. Well, we could have had him meet Morton anywhere, but again, to give it life, to give a texture to the film, we would have him meet in a swimming pool. That, that took us all morning to shoot that one three-second shot, four-second shot. You have my word. As originally scripted, this scene took place in a men's club. They simply met for lunch That's right. and passed documents over the table. But again, I think Richard rightly felt that there were just too many scenes and too many offices. Sunday evening, then. Sunday evening. And also, why not show something about the life these people led at the time? And it's also just a physically it's an extraordinary location. Oh, oh definitely. Yes. Can we have some more this was a tennis court originally, wasn't it? And we put it had it been back. turned into a croquet course That's by the right. staff at Chartwell. We restored it as a tennis court. Yeah. We managed to cast two extras who didn't know one end of a tennis racket from the other, and the director is about to make a movie about tennis, knows nothing about tennis either, so thank God we had Frank on set who can actually play tennis. My only contribution was telling them at least how to hold the rackets. <laughs> I couldn't do anything about them not hitting the balls, no, but at least was... I could make them look like they were playing. Half past 11. Where the hell is he? Morton promised. This scene came and went several times, didn't it? We decided whether we needed it, whether we didn't need it. It's interesting when you edit a film. There's really three distinct, or maybe four distinct processes to a film. Certainly writing a script is one. You think that's right. Then you shoot it and it changes again. And then really, once you go into editing, everything, you know, the balls are up in the air again because it doesn't matter what you shot, it has to work. I'm a great believer that if I spent, you know, a day doing any complicated camera move, I'll cut into the middle of it and put a close-up in if that's what's required to make the scene work. And I think we often see in movies, sometimes people do fall in love with photography and camera work to the detriment of the film. Mr. Churchill? Mr. Speaker? Before I am derided yet again... This reminded me about shooting the House of Commons. We had several hundred extras. And my assistant, Richard Whelan, did some amazing work here. He spent several days with them all, gave them all numbers. So each person knew they were number seven. 20 people who were number seven, 15 people were number eight. And so that he could hold up pieces of cardboard off camera in order to tell what people to cheer what things. We've heard it all, 
because the danger is if I say to the whole crowd, right, would a few of you like to just say rubbish? Well, which few of you? So they'll all stout rubbish. It's very hard to control a believable crowd, and I think he did a remarkable job in getting this crowd to feel like they were members of the House of Commons. It's interesting to know that even though Churchill memorized his speeches, he always had these crib sheets, which he would write out in longhand, and I think basically one sentence per page. And Albert replicated those exactly. Which is very handy for Albert. You have to learn the speeches too badly. Yes. It's very clever, very effective. And above all, it conceals the true scale of German rearmament. It's also fascinating if you look at photographs of Churchill in the house. He had a very distinct way of standing, which, again, Albert caught perfectly. It was very important for audience to understand that the feeling at that time in Europe was largely very pro-Germany, and the Nazis were not thought of to be uh, the horrors that we know them are today. In fact, in our research period, I remember finding several sets of diamond and ruby swastika earrings which members of the aristocracy in England would wear. People thought he was a great leader at the time. You know, he'd built the motorways, the autobahns, he had the Volkswagen design, he'd got people back on work, he'd got great architectural projects going. So from the outside, one must remember that Churchill was fighting an uphill battle. There was no hindsight then. People didn't know what a nightmare this man was going to become. Churchill really did stick his neck out at the time. ...with those terrible, chilling words, too late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Ferguson? The right honourable gentleman, the member for Everything oh. has. Oh. Dogs are all over the place. They had lots of dogs. The dogs were a nightmare. They'd never do anything you wanted them to. I so love a dog. Oh, I'm sure we could find you one. Off you go. <laughs> I'm afraid our garden's too small. It's the size of a postage stamp. Well, we have an absolute menagerie I'd here. I'd plan a scene where the With dogs would do this or that. Dogs, they were meant to be trained dogs. But they'd actually run in the opposite direction, so in the end you'd have to have the scene work around the dogs rather than the dogs work around the scene. I've written my own epitaph. Here lies a woman who was always tired because she lived in a world where too much was required. <laughs> Are landscapes your speciality? Mm. Oh, well, yes. This is the day we had near hurricane winds, wasn't it, later, Richard? Very, very loud wind. In fact, the scene when uh, Albert's painting under this tree... Albert found it very hard to concentrate. The wind was so loud. Of course, the irony was that, again, we'd been shooting in London for weeks and we'd been praying for a sunny day and we got nothing but grey rain and drizzle. We finally get this absolutely brilliantly sunny day in the morning. We think it's perfect for the scene when Church was outside painting. And then as the afternoon progressed, it became windier and windier and windier. So, again, we got the sun. We weren't expecting the gale force winds. But with the spirit calms the nerves... But I think a, on that shot, there's a prop man lying on the ground holding down the canvas. Yes. And the, you can't see him, but he's there somewhere. And I think Albert's hat was glued to his head. It was very windy. It doesn't look that windy there. We put up big pieces of silks on frames to stop the wind, but it was still it's very destructive wind, very hard to act in strong wind. He did a good job. Most of all, I'm, I'm worried about these papers, these... Sure Linus has that amazing capacity to portray strength and weakness at the same time, which was very useful in this character. It's all strictly confidential. May I call you Rafe if it's not too sudden? Please do. This was also a key scene in the sense this is really when Churchill, in effect, is seducing Rafe Wigram, who has enormous doubts about what he's doing. And through sheer force of personality, plus I think Wigram's conviction that ultimately he was doing the right thing, Churchill manages to secure his continuing involvement in slipping him documents and the papers that he needed. We call it my black dog. Painting drives it away, as does uh, bricklaying. I'm building a wall. Goes well with writing. 2,000 words, 200 bricks a day. Of course, if Wigram had been found out, he would have been executed. I think it would have been a crime of high treason. It was, yes, at the time. And certainly in wartime he would have been. He would have gone to prison, there's no question. And probably if war had been declared, he would have been executed. Very brave man. Come along, Rafe. I'll take these. You bring the easel. He has where Albert sings an old Cockney song. Churchill was, he was a strange man because he wasn't really, he didn't really relate to the, the working classes, but he loved so much about them. So he knew most old Cockney songs off by heart and was always singing to himself. Yes. Have fun. 
Yes, yes, we did, This is also really one of my favorite scenes because, again, on the page, it's a very informational scene. But Wilkinson brings such conviction as an actor and also a rather playful quality. Winston's so-called friends are all people who are useful to him. The idea of having a friend simply because you like someone has no place in Winston's work. You have to be very careful. What on? We tried to make this very short corridor look twice as long by turning around and shooting back the other way. We shot it on Steadicam, didn't we? And I think the Steadicam operator was taken ill and the assistant said, I'll have a go. Very tricky shot. He did a wonderful job. He said he would make a drum of his own mother's skin in order to sound his own praises. <laughs> as you can see, the house itself is quite ugly. But again, the views are spectacular. Who's this article for? Tommy and Winston would work through most meals. She was one of his great editors. She would read almost every article he wrote, look at his books, had much more astute political instincts in some instances. She really was the woman behind the man in many ways, wasn't she? Yes. And I think most historians feel that life with him was tolerable as long as she should get away, as you said, for significant periods of time. Very nice. More of an expedition. This scene was an interesting one to do when Vanessa finally loses her temper and hurls the terrine of Brussels sprouts at Albert, which was a special breakaway piece of china that if it hit him, it wouldn't actually cut him. But Vanessa was very loath to throw it at him. Komodo? What the hell's that? Actually, the original scene. As is recorded by historians, it was a terrine full of spinach. But the curators at Chartwell did not like the idea of a terrine full of spinach being flung around their very precious dining room. I think we settled on Brussels sprouts, compromise. which are a lot easier to clean up and will do less damage if they happen to ricochet off draperies. Or yeah, in fact, we did have to put up at the back, the drapes were ours, and we had to put plastic on the walls, plastic pieces, sheets of, of plexiglass to stop any stray product hitting the walls. A great adventure. We'd be away. I can remember months. this was one of the most difficult scenes to edit because Albert had his glasses, he was writing, smoking a cigar, eating, and drinking champagne. And I don't think there were ever two takes where anything ever matched. Not really. No, continuity was neither of their strong points, really, but they certainly <laughs> they made up for it in their acting. See how he's got his head tucked right down into his body? There's no neck at all. I should know, I've got very little neck either. And you think it's all right, do you, to leave us, to go off chasing lizards this again with Walter Guinness? was a scene that Hugh found when he was reading through various oh, books on Churchill that Clemmy would occasionally become so My exasperated with Winston that she would throw things at him. It was the only way that she felt that she could end an argument or make a point and to get his attention was to hurl a piece of crockery or a plate or a glass. Do not accuse me of being selfish. Do not dare! This one hit him firmly and swelly on the arm, I think. It's a very good shot. And yes, she is. She Vanessa is. wanted to throw a potatoes, baked potatoes at him. I said, I didn't think it would have the same effect, Vanessa. You've got to throw the terrine. Here we go. Terrine throwing in one shot. Bang! First take. It hits him on the head and smashes. I think she was actually stunned that she hit him. She was. She was quite shocked that produced that rather wonderful performance. She goes off because I think she, she was a bit frightened she'd hurt him. Sorry, sir. I thought somebody... Little Maid, I thought, was a wonderful character. What we tried to do with all the characters was to have no-one in the film, really, that didn't have some story to tell. So there are no walk-on parts. Everyone's got some, well, hopefully got some personality. And this Little Maid was wonderful. The scene coming up where Churchill goes to apologise to Clemmy was a scene that I had most reservations about. When I first read the script... Mm. And Hugh had told me that Churchill would bark at his wife and Clemmy would meow like a cat. I said to Richard, there's no way in the world we can have Albert Finney and Vanessa Redgrave barking and meowing each other. It will be completely ludicrous. No actors in the world could pull it off. And much to my amazement, somehow, they seem to make it work. And it's very touching and not at all as ludicrous as one would think. It's also a very sexually charged moment. I think there are very few moments that I've seen in film where characters of this age create such an erotic moment. Mm, they do. You know very much that when this moment is finished, they're going into the bedroom and they're going to make love. I love the way she says meow and tells him off by the meow. Meow. Yes. She's cross with him. Meow. 
Vanessa is a wonderful actress. And that's all in one shot, though. I like to shoot things as much as possible so that you choreograph the camera and the actors rather than cutting in for close-ups. First of all, it allows you to get through a day's work more efficiently. It also makes the movie look bigger. What you see on, on this film is almost everything we shot. There wasn't much spare material. An interesting script problem here in that our leading lady disappears from the film for about 20, 25 minutes in the middle. And we felt it was necessary to dramatize this. And I think we labored a great deal both during the scripting and the filming, how to keep Clemmie, who was this incredibly important present in Churchill's life, alive in the film, even though she was off screen for a, a large section of it. And how are you this morning, sir? And I think when Hugh came up with the idea of using the letters back and forth between them to keep her alive, and also working with a composer, we decided to use themes that were very much identified with the couple, so we would score the scenes with those themes, which we thought would again remind the audience of her. So she was, in fact, absent, but very much a presence in Churchill's life, and I think it kept her alive in the film and kept you expecting her return. This is a scene in that lovely scene in the bath. I think this is a piece of my madness triggered from somewhere, but the idea that... She was always there, but she was... I think it was an interview I did with one of the secretaries. Said she was often there and Churchill would be in the bath. But when he drops the soap, in fact, she had three bars of soap down there. To get it in one shot, when she throws it back, that's not a CGI effect. She really does. She couldn't look, of course, because she couldn't look at Churchill. I love the way she wipes her hands on his socks. He never knows that. But when she to get rid of the soap, she just used a pair of his old socks. Well, all right, all right. Don't break your heart about it. I also think Albert's a man of extraordinary confidence. Yeah. I mean, one of the most handsome actors in all of film history. Had no vanity at this point in his career at all. He had no problem getting out of bed naked, had no problem being in the tub. They're not the most flattering angles, the most flattering shots. No. But Wonderful it's very confidence. true to the character. There is no doubt that the Germans are superior to us in the air at the present time. Looking at the film now, there's a lot of talking in this movie. It's a real credit to the actors. Possibly be. I don't think it does become slow and boring and confined. You always feel you're involved with the characters. Well, it has enormous forward momentum in terms of the storytelling as the plot thickens, as it were. Oh, what on earth did he get all that information? Winston makes it his business to be well informed. But I don't like it. It could do immense damage to our trade with Germany. Not to mention the cost of rearmament. I mean, where does he think the money's coming from? I want him isolated. Tell the whips. Only a short distance away, there dwells a nation of... Again, we heard from a lot of sources that Churchill, when he was dictating or working, would become so lost in his work, they would absolutely forget where he was and was always about to disrobe, undress at almost any moment. And this is one of those moments that we thought captured that perfectly. The words preparation of defence is not to assert the imminence of war. On the contrary... If war was imminent, preparations for defense would be too late. However calmly surveyed, the danger of an air attack on London must This is under a Masonic lodge in the center of London, and these, these storage boxes are actually London's for Masonic aprons, what we used as um, deposit boxes for documents, very like the reality of what they use. The beast of prey. We cannot retreat. We cannot move London. The sequence shot in Fleet Street, the same streets where Clemmie arrived to go and see the accountant. Very hard to get permission to film in London today. Times, get your newspapers. Get your papers here. There is Clemmie. Thank you for your letter. Churchill, who wrote quite passionate letters to his wife, dictated them to his secretaries. So in between dictating a speech to the House dictating a volume on one of the articles he was writing or his biography on Marlborough, was actually dictating letters to his wife. Yeah. He was not embarrassed to... Very loving letters, too. I mean, they, the letters, one of the things that moved me most were reading the letters between the two of them. They were very much in love all their lives. Ten men, and will therefore please the accountant. As you will have heard, 
Randolph was heavily defeated in the by-election and lost his deposit. This resulted, of course, a setback. This scene we also went back and shot, I believe, in January as well, Richard, because we wanted to get a different feeling in time. If I achieve anything, they all say it's because of you. Churchill's son, who was not the politician his father was, and I don't think ever was successfully elected to any office. Mm. I want to make a life of my own. All right, do what you like. Make a fool of yourself. I don't give a damn. Go to hell, Papa. I'm not staying in this bloody house a moment longer. Bugger! Sprouts again, sir. Cauliflower. Churchill hated contemporary theater. He hated song and dance. I think he was a great lover of Gilbert and Sullivan. Mary and I want to see the show that Sarah and so Richard wanted to stage something that was true to the period, but also, I think, was as elaborate and broad as it could be, so that we would have the fun of recreating the number, but also the fun of seeing Churchill's horror at what was passing at popular entertainment at the time. I must admit, Richard, when you told me that you wanted to have the women dressed as either powder puffs or lipsticks, I thought you had gone completely mad. But you pulled it off. Well, we give it a bit of help. Yes, that was a great scene. Take it off, off the heel, off the When you're seen anywhere with your hat off, have a Marcel waving your hand. Can't imagine what she sees in him. Common as debt. Diana, I know. She couldn't drive. In fact, he's being driven by a left-hand drive stuntman, and she's sitting there holding a fake steering wheel. dealt with the situation very clumsily, I'm afraid. I wish profoundly that you'd been there to offer comfort and advice. <laughs> it's getting deeper in, Richard! This was actually on the grounds at the lake, Chartwell. Amazing we got permission, because obviously this is a national monument. We dug up tons of earth, so we weren't very popular. No good. Hopeless. 98 degrees, sir. As the scene shows, it's true that Churchill would have the temperature measured of every bath that was drawn for him by inches, had to be exactly 98 degrees, and then when it had reached 98 degrees, he would step in the tub, and inches would then begin to fill, fill the tub with more hot water to a temperature that was just short of boiling Churchill. It's exactly <laughs> like he wanted to take every bath. Of course, he had the staff to accommodate his rather eccentric taste, He was always looking for letters from, from the Clemmy, Mr. Enormously. It was, I think, the balance between a love story and a political thriller, as I guess it would be called, is what helped to keep the story alive for me, anyway. Evening Standard. Have you seen it? I think it's also the section of the film that we edited and re-edited the most, to get the exact balance between the personal moments and the political moments. Yeah. Excuse me, to make him? What? 10.30? Yes. Yes, I will not allow him to interfere with government policy. No, We've been asked to do a second part, another film about Churchill. And, of course, the irony is that after having spent a huge amount of money to build the House of Commons, our second film picks up after this was bombed. So we have yet another set to recreate. Hopefully we've saved some of those benches. Hopefully I wouldn't count on it, Frank. The <laughs> film industry has a terrible habit of destroying stuff. Make him aware of their displeasure. See, he's erratic, totally unreliable. I think this scene is also one of Richard's great contributions to the film. This is a key scene between Tom Wilkinson and Linus Roach, in which Vansittart is letting Rafe Wigram know that there are rumors out there about him feeding information to Winston Churchill. And he wants to do it in a way to let Rigram know he's got to be careful, but to keep doing it. As originally scripted, this was two men sitting across a table in yet another men's club, and Richard wanted to stage at the crush bar at the theater. And I think what it does to the scene, which is not open up visually and give it more drama, it's really fascinating that Vansittart is confident enough of himself as a character, that he has no compunction about talking in public and making the whole thing seeming very casual at the same time 
delivering this message. So I think for all sorts of reasons, it's a vast improvement over what was originally scripted. And of course, Wiggum was in the situation of having to pretend to be innocent and at the same time hearing exactly what Vantatart's saying. No unnecessary risks, if you know what I mean. Here we are. Hello. There you are, my darling. Here's an example of, of using modern, you know, modern image, the underground station, which now that station was built probably about five years before our, our story takes place, so it was a relatively modern piece of architecture. We must defend our island from foreign aggression. Stop. Oh, clear. We should the repudiate war, defeatism and pacifism. Stop. And I think it's one of Albert's great moments. He looks so much like Churchill. It's for you, sir, Mr. Wigram. In this particular scene, it's really stunning. It is strong. Brave, how are you? Winston, I can't go on with this. When you're playing a scene like this, you've almost never got the other actor available to do the other end of the telephone conversation. So you've got either the director or the continuity girl reading the other lines, and the actor has to pretend they're talking to another great actor on the other end of a phone. It's amazing how they're able to compartmentalise their brains to do it. Brave KBO, remember our motto, keep buggering on. This is another moment in the film where I think Richard showed how effective silhouettes can be. Life is drab Just the shape of Churchill and that hat and the cigar. If it weren't for me, I'd be utterly miserable. Now, I just want to show you the scale, the distance. Originally, yeah, he was just drawing. What's he doing? Was he drawing it in a book or something? No, he was just looking over a map telling Mary. Oh, a map, that's right. I just thought it would be a good way of explaining the distance for a child, the relative distance. So she, she throws this piece of wallpaper down the stairs at Chartwell. Your desert island picnic with Mr. Philip sounds idyllic. That was not, of course, not Chartwell, it was yet another house. It is over 11 weeks since you left Chartwell. And I'm counting the seconds until you return. To Komodo, where the dragons are. It really is a long way. Thank you, Steve. Paragraph. Ah. Diane has gone back to her it's husband. A great scene, great comedy scene coming uh -huh. out, one of my favourites. But I fear the marriage will not last. Stop. <laughs> Inches out, I'm in the middle of a letter. Telephone, sir. Out. The man says it's important. I believe most of the scene is taken really verbatim important. from a source that Hugh found. Oh, really? Who the hell is Major Sankey? He actually said this stuff. Yeah. Yes. The whole idea that he could actually say to his servants that he was a great man. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. And of course he was right. He was. He got away with it too. Have you no sensitivity whatsoever? There's no need to be insulted. But they all seemed to care about him. They couldn't dismiss him. He was a bully, but they, they all had a lot of time for him, I think, as a character. She's gone to lunch, sir. Well then do it yourself. I am not acquainted with the mechanism, sir. Oh, God almighty bloody hell. You are very rude to me, Inches. Very rude to me, sir. Yes. But I'm a great man. You're a stupid old bugger. <sighs> Originally, when he goes down and takes this phone call from Major Sankey, that was a scene we were going to shoot. And then we tried to restage it. We had so many locations and, and only an amount of money to spend. We ended up realising that actually you didn't have to hear the conversation. It was the beginning and the end that were more important. So we just cut it out. They don't like all his speeches about Germany. They want to shut him this up. This also gave us a chance to spend more time with Inches and Mrs. P mm. to find out what they were like when Churchill was out of the room. It's curious for someone who was such an autocrat and so clearly had a sense of class and the distinctions that he was rather on good terms with all of the staff. I think he made friends of them all and was very close and very supportive. Never. Not even liberal. Buggers! This is absolutely the worst thing of my whole bloody life. I'm surrounded by enemies. Churchill also had a prodigious memory. He could memorize vast numbers of lines of poetries and speeches and call them forth at any moment. So this is one of those moments where Hugh had wanted to show that facility of Churchill's, and he happens to have the exact poem that's right for this occasion. The actors shriek and the coupling strain. The pace is hot and the points are near. 
and sleep has deadened the driver's ear. Albert was so involved in the scene that I never he almost the knocked the door off the hinges train. going out. For death is in charge of the clattering train. He'll be needing a glass of champagne. Uh, possibly too. Charlie, Mummy's nearly finished, and then I promise we'll go out to the park. This scene again is taken from a source that you had found, which I find quite shocking, that a member of the government actually came to threaten Ray Frigram's wife. What are you reading, Charlie? Good afternoon, Miss Biffer. Mrs. Wigram. I'm afraid my husband's not home. It was you I came to see. Me? Please, do sit down. Thank you. And the threat is very clear that they will transfer him to a place help. where either she'll have to stay behind with her child or they'll have to go to some place where there's no medical care, which would probably mean the death of their son. Mm. It was as brutal, brutal as it could be. What do you mean? It's perhaps not wise. Good and it's curious because, again, it's so beautifully cloaked with polished manners and elegant phrases, but the thread is very, very clear indeed. I'm quite sure he takes note of what you say. What my husband does is his own business. I wouldn't dream of trying to interfere. No, no, of course not. But do remember your husband is the head of an important part of the foreign office. Lena Headey, who plays this it's part, was very nervous about playing an upmarket girl because she comes from the north of England working class family. And I think she took on the mantle of middle classdom incredibly well. Please, Mr. Pettifer, don't treat me like a child. If your husband. A strength in this scene as a strong woman. Very fine bit of acting. And he's so unbelievably swarmy. Isn't he sm smarmy? Yeah, he really is. Difficult for him to travel, I mean. Difficult also, I should imagine, to find the appropriate medical assistance in certain parts of the world. He was completely bald under that wig he's wearing. I mean, he just finished another movie. And he had a shaven head, so he had a lot of wigs flying around in this film. A tactical error. When a member of the government comes to my house and threatens me so openly... It's very strange how you, as a director, you look back at movies you've done that were hard work. I've worked on films that have been the happiest times of my life and the unhappiest time. And somehow, after a few years have gone by, you forget the pain and suffering that you went through. Producers don't. No, you don't. You remember. It's all written down <laughs> to hold against it. <laughs> exactly. For future reference. Good afternoon, Mrs. Wigram. What do you want, Mr. Churchill? I'm looking for a letter. What letter? I thought there might be something from Clemmy. I think we almost okay. lost this location because it was on the market and had not been sold for a couple of years, and I think an offer was made and accepted, and I think they wanted to close the day we were filming. Perhaps tomorrow? <sighs> Does the... Uh... It's an interesting scene. I'd shot a commercial in these woods about 20 years before, and I had a forgotten location. I'd forgotten where it was. I had no idea. I knew it was somewhere in southern England. Which narrows it down. It does narrow it down. <laughs> and I, I kept on. I tried to find the team who worked on the commercial, and most of them had, had passed on to moved off this mortal <laughs> coil. And I found eventually found the driver who'd driven me there, and he knew roughly where it was. And I spent several of my hard-earned weekends traveling around looking for it, and eventually found this wonderful ancient woodland. It's an old coaching track where the edge of the road is actually this field long abandoned. You had, yes, you had a very specific memory of trees with big trunks, and you had half the location department in London looking for these. And they kept coming back with thousands of photographs of trees with big trunks, and Richard kept saying, no, those are trees with big trunks, but they're not the trees with the big trunks. It's true. I guess it was worth it. It is a pretty remarkable location as you move on. I don't know if we've captured it in this, but I think we have. But the fact that it was totally inaccessible. <laughs> it was. It was up dirt tracks with four-wheel drive vehicles. Wasn't interested. I used to think it was because I, I smoked too much. Tobacco is bad for love. Old age is worse. You're talking nonsense, Winston. I've lived too long. I'm in the ruck. I've drunk too deeply of the cup. I cannot spend, I cannot fuck, I'm down and out, I'm buggered up. We thought, do we actually dare have Winston Churchill using the most forbidden word in the English language? Which apparently did use, but never in front of ladies. <laughs> yes, 
We got the comment back that it was perfectly acceptable as long as he wasn't swearing in front of the ladies. Mm -hmm. And this was a poem that was translated from the Pushkin. You'll be home soon, Winston. Grab me a jacket. These fish were supposed to be feeding, but of course it had gotten too cold, so koi don't eat, apparently, when the temperature drops. Well, they go to sleep. <laughs> Unlike me, who eats when the temperature drops enormously. <laughs> This fish pond idea came from at Chartwell. I'd heard that Finney used to feed the carp pond. The real carp pond is quite much smaller than that and is about 12 feet deep. I just had this idea of image of him rushing, loving his wife so much that he actually didn't care and just couldn't wait to go round the edge of the pond but went straight to the middle of it. And so we concocted this image. What on earth are you talking about? We couldn't film it at Chartwell because the pond was too deep. So we went to somewhere else where the pond wasn't as deep. And we did this with the sun going down. We did one take of it. It was all disaster. We were losing the light, and I think it's one of the most wonderful bits of that. Two shots in the whole sequence. You also framed it so that you don't realize how long the pond is. Yes, so there's no way. It makes no sense he would have gone round the pond. He had to cut across it. But I think the effect on the audience to see this man is trying to run the country or trying to get into power, doing something as childlike as that, I think it's a... Um, if ever I had an idea, I think that was one of them. It was the execution that was everything. This was Albert and Vanessa's first scene together, as I remember, the church. It was, yeah. And I think as we stood on the set watching this first take, we knew there was something extraordinary happening between them, which really we didn't see at rehearsal. There wasn't that much rehearsal, but when they came together, I think we thought mm. that... Again, you see all in one shot, no cover, no close-ups, just a craning shot over. Very simple photography by Peter Hannon, very effective. Time. This scene, as I remember, almost didn't make it into the film because originally, as conceived, Vanessa was going to be wearing a dressing gown. At the last moment, she decided that it would be much more effective and really much more sensual if, in fact, her arms were bare. The problem was the evening gown was in London three hours away. And the question was, could we get someone from location to London to get the proper gown back in time to actually shoot the scene? And I must admit, even though we were all tearing our hair out at the moment, I think Vanessa was exactly right. The fact that we see Clemmie's arm and the beautiful neckline as she's powdering herself makes the scene much more sensual and much more emotional than I think it would have been if she was in her dressing gown. It's very interesting. I hear as much in demand. I've seen it. Uh, it's one of my favorite scenes as well, when she goes to the window at the end and looks out. The origin of the scene was staged Sure Again, I talked about earlier about how I like to sort of displace scenes a bit, and this one was, of course, you know, it's a very romantic scene. They, they should be sitting down looking at each other, and I wanted to play it so that they were not looking at each other. It seemed to me there was so much hidden text, emotions between the lines. Did you fall in love with him? So she's not looking at him, and he's, well, he's looking at her, but she never really faces him. You make me like him. And we talked about whether we needed a shot of the lake there, and I, I think I was right, we didn't need a shot of the lake. It would have broken the moment too much. Oh, Mr. Pug. Your new island looks lovely. We talked a great deal about the film, whether it was necessary to go to Germany to see firsthand what was going on in Nazi Germany. And I think we decided that the one image of the invasion of the Rhineland and this one extraordinary shot of Hitler giving the speech gave us everything we need to tell the audience, actually to remind the audience of what was going on in Nazi Germany. And I think also, Richard, your decision to play the scene off of Linus as he's watching it also gave it a context that it wouldn't have had if we had simply gone to Germany for expositional reasons. I think it was good we did that. I, the idea of him standing in the aisle I'm just pleased that he's actually, he's so shocked by what he sees. He's very near to his breakdown now. There's something about wet Sunday afternoons with rain running down the windows that produces a melancholia. We're powerless. Hitler's preparing I think it to set the tone for how Linus was going to play the scene. Of course we can and we shall. I should never have shown you those papers. What do you mean? 
Well, perhaps the Prime Minister's right. Perhaps we should try to find a compromise with Herr Hitler. Well, it'll be ridiculous. I think Linus is also remarkable in this moment when he's suggesting he's on the verge of a breakdown of some sort. For God's sake, mm. Ray, what ridiculous nonsense is this? Ray, you're tired. We should go home. Hundreds of thousands of people will die. Millions. And I shall be responsible. Weeks, that's just not true. Partly responsible, then. How would you be remotely responsible? And again, it's a little bit obvious, but the fact that we were able to use in the soundtrack, the sound of the picture, the approaching thunder, mm. and the sound of the storm, when in fact this is a scene where Linus Roach is talking about what he sees coming, which is Hitler invading and taking over most of Europe. And then Czechoslovakia, and then God knows what, the whole of Europe. There may be a war. When I first read this scene, when Hugh told me that Churchill, as a schoolboy, had said to a friend of his that his destiny was going to be save England and the empire from destruction. When I was in school... And it's very well documented, again, how this man at that age knew this was his destiny. It's quite extraordinary. It's both incredibly arrogant and quite remarkable that he saw his whole future that clearly. One day in the future, Britain will be in great danger. And it will fall to me to save London and the Empire. Finney brings it off, doesn't he? Schoolboy fantasy. You could so easily lose empathy with a man. You could just Catherine. reject him. Arrogant? But you don't. You go with him. My destiny. He won Best Actor of Emmy this really year, and he certainly it. deserved it. You're an extraordinary man, Winston. I am. I know it. Nobody but you could say that sort of thing and expect people to believe it. Destiny is what I believe in. Destiny commands. We must obey. I think the other great asset of using rain is when we get to the exterior of the house and that rather haunting image of Clemmy and Winston driving away and Lena Hetty there alone under the umbrella in the rain, which again is so much more poignant than I think it would have been on a sunny day. Because not only do you have that wonderful silhouette of the umbrella, you have the sound of the rain all around her. I think it's a remarkable image. All over Europe is the hush of suspense. It's a different land. point of view of the house's problem that you very rarely see, I think, in film. Yeah, it's hard to get it. There's only about two angles that you can film the house apartment from without getting modern stuff in. And that's one of them. We have steadily disarmed. We had a tug, but it wasn't quite the right period. So Angus, our effects man, actually used the hull of the tug, but then put the superstructure of a 1930s tug on top of it. But a change must now be made. Amazing what they can do. We must not continue longer on a course in which we alone are growing weaker, while Germany is growing stronger. Yeah. We added the scene quite late in the movie when Churchill and Stanley Baldwin talk in the men's room at the House of Commons. I hear there's a nonsensical rumor that you're about to retire. I think that, having looked at the script, we decided that the bad guy seemed just too simple, that we hadn't really explored what people like Baldwin and other members of the government were thinking when they so wanted to avoid war. And I think, again, it's a scene that fleshed out that character in that part of the story. And also, I, again, staging in the men's room, I think, was much more effective. As originally scripted, again, I think they had met and were talking in an office or somewhere. I think an office. But I've always admired your great political skills. Winston, let me tell you something. To my mind, war is the greatest folly that can afflict mankind. No, absolutely, no question about it. I also like the fact you've got three people there. You're having these two great men having a conversation. There's another man there who's basically holding a towel, as indeed they did. You know, there was always an attendant there who would have been there to brush them down. And the text of the speech comes from a letter that Baldwin had written to one of his constituents, talking about why he was so adverse to war and the consequences. Irreparable loss. That's what I've been hoping to prevent. But, as I say, you may well be right. 
Of course, all of these men had seen action in the First World War, so mm -hmm. it wasn't theoretical for them. They had been in the trenches. Churchill himself had been in the trenches. I think this scene went through a number of rewrites. And Hugh finally decided, instead of making Rafe Wigman very morose at this moment and very depressed, it was to today. treat his breakdown in a rather different way. He's suddenly quite mind. euphoric. Thousands of them. Hence all the telegrams. Hitler's planning to invade the world, and we're planning to do nothing about it. What do you make of that, Marjorie? Oh, well, I'm... Uh... Perhaps we should go home. What do you think? Or we could take a stroll at St. James's Park. It's remarkable where... I did a documentary about suicide on well, television years and years ago. Well, one of the things I found out was that what allows people to commit suicide, this is a generalisation, I suspect, is that it's a solution to their suffering. So you get this period just before they commit suicide where they're quite happy and seem quite calm. And that's often why the loved ones of the person who commits suicide don't notice it. They think they're getting better. Thank you for these. There is a solution there, and, and I gave that idea that you and he ran with it wonderfully. Marjorie, I meant to ask, what time is the defence meeting tomorrow? I don't think you're required at that meeting, Mr Wigram. We haven't received any notification. She was very good, wasn't she, the secretary? Not she was required. lovely. Very small part, but just such empathy. Fine. Funny how word gets around. Again, in one of those situations where the truth is so much more dramatic than fiction, the fact that Wigram committed suicide right around Christmas yeah, was even more poignant. Much more poignant. Remember in rehearsal, Richard, the little boy had a yellow balloon, which I thought was decidedly ugly. And I had mentioned to you when you looked at me as if to say, you don't think I'd use a yellow balloon. And then suddenly a red balloon appeared, which you had planned all the time. The image of the balloon going away and the little boy looking up after it didn't quite work as I wanted it to, but never get anything perfect. And him sitting alone with the Christmas lights on. Very sad image. But all, truthfully, it was all at that time of the year when it happened. I think that was the most difficult prop to find. Period Christmas tree lights from the 1930s. Yeah, they don't last long because the bulbs had all gone. We couldn't get the bulbs, but they didn't go on. What's wrong? There's a calmness about him here, you'll see, which is what we wanted to give the feeling, that he'd found a solution to his problems, which was, of course, to kill himself. Because, indeed, that's what happened. This is quite mysterious. The evidence for his suicide is very simply that he had a large family a large number of friends, and no one showed up at his funeral. No. Nope. Not a single member of his family. A few friends, his wife, but his entire family was absent. And some historians feel that because suicide was considered such a disgrace, it was clear in their minds that, in fact, he had committed suicide. Interesting. One script we had him actually falling down to the ground, crying out. And in this, I wanted to have the feeling that from that moment when she goes to the window and the snow's settled and she's talking optimistically about their time together. And I think the audience by now knows something's wrong as we're starting to move across the room. But she's still living at the moment. Everything is there. They've got Christmas coming. They've got snow. They're going to the park that afternoon. And for the next three minutes of her life, everything's perfect. I, I just thought there was something really poignant about this. Again, it's interesting that Richard was looking for a surprise for this set, so he found a cemetery in which there's this huge... It's a storage tank for gas, isn't Gasometer, it? Gasometer, they're called, yes. Word turn out from Whitehall. I know. But again, instead of a standard merchant and ivory yeah, image like of a cemetery from the 1930s, the fact that we put something industrial in it, I think, changed it quite dramatically. It says pulmonary hemorrhage on the death certificate. I think we should leave it at that. Again, one shot, and there's no cover from the first moment you see them. Just simple track and crane, wonderful tool, the camera crane. He said it was all pointless. I remember we had some Everything adverse reaction attractive. from the studio in Los Angeles when they had seen the hat we had chosen for Lena. They were concerned that we didn't see her eyes completely. And I think we all felt that the brim of the hat made the scene much more mysterious and much more evocative. Please tell me it wasn't wasted. Ava, my dear, 
You'll be very proud of him. People know often act heroic. When you know characters well, you don't have to see everything about them because it's like shooting in cars. Sometimes you can shoot the backs of people's heads in cars as well as you can their faces, and the shoulders of a good actor tell you as much as the eyes do. In spite of his fear, no man can be braver than that. Thank you, Winston. This scene was very convenient in that we had a tricky script situation where Ray Frigum killed himself in December of 1937, and we have to very gracefully move to September of 1939. We use this scene as a transition to take us from December of 1937 until September of 1939, which again, I think we just got away with. Mm-hmm. No one seems to be bothered by the... We had to compress so much time up. Any invading force would march across our little bit of England on their way to London. I wonder how long we've got. This is a still, a moving shot of the window, and the surrounding building is a still photograph. I wanted it to be just a little light in the darkness, but obviously it couldn't be completely stylized. Now hear a statement by the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Neville Chamberlain. I am this again is one of the most extraordinary moments of the film. This announcement, this broadcast that the Prime Minister gave from 10 Downing Street on the morning that war was declared, I think has lost none of its power to move. It's a very simple statement, but it's so resonant and so evocative. And the stillness of this moment, just the characters listening to this announcement, with her holding the frozen of the teapot. A state of war would exist between us. Time stood still. I have to tell you I love now, the way she holds his hand no at the end of this. You know, the couple you've seen arguing at the beginning. They're not married, they're just their old two servants. This country is at war with Germany. But obviously their relationship is much warmer and closer than we've seen. I think that's a really poignant moment. I like this detail of her taping the windows at Chartwell on the morning that war was declared. Mrs. Churchill! Mr. Churchill! Up there! Mrs. P, what's the matter? Telephone, sir. The Prime Minister's office. We had an interesting problem here. The problem with the story is, is that he didn't get the job as Prime Minister until eight months later. So we had to make a crescendo, which was him becoming First Lord of the Admiralty, which meant he was back in power. He had some position of power, but he hadn't actually achieved what he needed to achieve. First Lord of the Admiralty back in power. <laughs> it was structurally quite tricky. We messed around with the end of this movie, didn't we, a lot? But also for most people, the idea that you become First Lord of the Admiralty, first of all, we had to clarify for the American audience what that meant. And second of all, it seems like he's gotten second prize, not first prize. Absolutely. And heroes are meant to get first prize in movies. Yes. But I think it's very clear that he is returning to power. I think that's also why we ultimately decide to put that short crawl on to let the audience know this was, in fact, a step mm. to his ultimate return. There may be difficult and painful times ahead, but now that I'm in charge of the Navy, and Mr. Hitler and his Nazi thugs had better look out. We're going to teach them a lesson they'll never forget. I love the way he kisses the little maid at the end. So she's tied up as a character. Their relationship is solid. Now, in the original script, and as we shot the film, we used to go right from Churchill in the car with Clemmy here to him going up the steps at the Admiralty. And Richard had seen a very early cut before we finished shooting the film, and he suddenly realized there was a beat missing, that we had gone too quickly from Chartwell to the Admiralty. And we all scrambled around thinking, what was the moment that we needed? And we came up with these two scenes, actually the very short scene where we want to know Churchill is eager to get to the Admiralty. He did, in fact, leave Chartwell and go right to the office that first night. We wanted to establish that, but more importantly, I think we wanted to resolve the relationship between Winston and Clemmy before he took on the mantle of power. And we shot this scene twice. We scrambled within the last couple of days of shooting to get it, 
We had a version that was okay, but it wasn't as good as we wanted to. And again, thanks to HBO, we were able to go back and shoot this. And having thought about it for a couple of months, I think got a much better version of it. Just before the Battle of Blenheim, Marvelous said to his aide, Today, I conquer or die. Now I know how he felt. Vanessa was keen not to speak in it, and when we did the second time, I was very keen she didn't. Thank you. She doesn't say much, she just says... For what? For what? For being rash enough to marry me. But it's just so beautifully rash done. enough to stay with me. He lets his voice break. And loving me in a way I thought I'd never be loved. It was the first take we used. With actors, sometimes you have to be ready to get that first take because they never get it again. I think also for me, this is one of Albert's most impressive moments. The way he goes from this incredibly emotional moment, he gets out of the car and suddenly he is a man of power again as he climbs up those steps. Unlike seeing him slumping out of bed in that morning, everything about him, the posture, the clip in his walk, the way he holds his cane. Good evening. Good evening, sir. And the new first law. And this location yes, sir, has been shot a thousand times, but everybody shoots looking down at it. I don't think anybody's ever shot looking up at the ceiling. Winston is back, sir. <laughs> Winston is back. Mm. And so he bloody well is. I like the idea that we had his coming to power is with a young, one young man, instead of a thousand people at the top of a great steps. It was a small moment, but it was a very large moment on film. Thank you for listening, and Richard, thank you for a wonderful film. And it was fun reliving it with you. It was great fun. We're doing it again, I hope. Rarely in your life do you get a chance to work on a film that's as rewarding as this one.
the stock market, was riding around the clock, but despite that he lived extremely extravagantly, as you can tell from the cars and the large staff that he seemed to be under his employ constantly. Yeah, he was always stretched for money, never had enough. This scene, when we shot this, and we wanted to go back and do some more, and we had to... Some of these shots are shot in the studio with moving green screen plates behind. The trouble was that the leaves had gone off the trees by then. We couldn't shoot a plate. I'm sure audience will understand about this. In fact, I think the shot we're looking at now is a fake green screen. So we actually went and shot the forest with all the leaves off and then tinted the whole shot sort of green and brown. And it seems to work pretty well. But it was a nightmare when you go back. One of the great things about HBO, I have to say, as a director working for them, is they always keep a bit of money up their sleeve for doing some additional shooting. I've made quite a few movies in my life, and, you know, what I shot was what I had, but what we did on this film and what we've done on the next film for HBO was to actually look at the film, cut the movie, and then say, well, OK, what would we like to put into it? And that's an enormous asset to any director. The period shots of London were tricky to get. I think we were told we could go between 5 and 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning completely control the traffic and actually from the angles you chose Richard the House of Commons is pretty much unchanged pretty clear there's some scaffolding we had to take off in CGI computer graphics but we're now looking at the interior of the House of Parliament you know this is um, the main room and that was built by Lucci as a set I think the other thing that distinguishes the film is when we were looking for locations, what happens with period films is that people usually tend to find very pristine period locations I know when we were looking for the exterior of Fleet Street for example when Clemmy goes to visit the accountant, you wanted a combination of architecture. So you chose a street which actually had that great 1930s building yeah. as well. It was a newspaper office, but it had been built, I think, two years before our film started. So it would have been a brand new building. We used a tube station. I didn't want the film to... The tendency with sort of English period movies for them all to be old-fashioned, but, you know, everyone had antiques. The Romans had antiques. The Egyptians had antiques, so... You know, we don't want everything in our movie to be of the same period, so we had new stuff and old stuff in the film, which I think helps to make a back environment in which the actors feel realer. We had heard when someone had previously tried to negotiate with the family for some of the rights for speeches, whatever, and the lawyer came back and said, by the way, it has to be gross, not net participation. And everybody was very curious why he was insisting on that. Was it the family? They said, no, no, this comes from Winston himself. The lawyers for the producers were rather thrown. They said, what do you mean it comes from Winston himself? Has there been some sort of seance? Are you communicating with the dead? They said there was a letter from Clemmy that Winston had written after he had taken a trip to Los Angeles. He was having dinner, I think it was with Jimmy Stewart, and Jimmy Stewart had advised him, if anybody ever wants to do anything on your film, your life, you must insist on a gross participation. So they had documents dating back from the 50s in the record, and they used that to make the deal for all of future film rights. What did he say? He promised to cut down to three bottles of champagne in the evening. I'd assume that Churchill, I think like many people in this country, was just a kind of bully, a bully that was necessary at that time because they had a bully, so we needed a bully. But Churchill was a multifaceted man. I mean, he was, he was full of angst and pain. He was a depressive, but he was a genius. He got an awful lot wrong before the war and afterwards. But what he really got right was this period of his life witnessing my own demise. Morton walking across the hill here, this is actually shot in the... We had a very late summer, this is shot in October, but we just about get away with it with the leaves on the trees. You had worked with Jim Broadbent beforehand, hadn't you? Uh, done a couple of movies with Jim, yes. Yeah, a great, wonderful man to work with. Effortless, he just comes on. And you think, in rehearsals, first rehearsals, Jim will come on with a silly voice and you'll think, that'll never work. And by God, the time he's put it together on film, it's immaculate. He really does become somebody different than every film he makes, I think. Black Dog Day, we're relying on you to shake him out of it. He came back from London in a terrible mood and he's been like that ever since. The Black Dog and the pigs. Yes, Churchill really did keep pigs and he go down.
My name's Richard Longcrane. I directed The Gathering Storm, which originally wasn't called The Gathering Storm. It was called, Frank, what was it called? The Lonely War. And Frank, what did you do on the film? I was one of the producers of the film. Frank one of the, several. <laughs> no, Frank was the producer of the film, to be honest. We had lots of help from other people, but Frank was the guy that was with me from day one to day 5001. And, uh, Depending on which day, it was either a blessing or a curse. No, it wasn't a curse. But anyway, Frank, you started this project long before I did, so tell everyone about how it started. I think the impetus was to explore a period of history and a man that everybody knows about and very little about personally. People know Churchill, the hero, the leader of the war. I don't think anybody really knew about Churchill in the early 30s when he was a lone voice in England, crying out again what, what was going on in Nazi Germany, listened to by absolutely no one. And I also think that he was a truly eccentric man. And again, most versions of films about Churchill have only been the great accomplishments, the great hits, as you were, of his life. So I think what Hugh wanted to do was to try to find everything about the man that we didn't know. And I think what you did so successfully, Richard, was to, with Albert Finney, show Churchill warts and all. The Hugh we refers to as Hugh Whitemore, the writer, whom we owe an awful lot. I have to declare that I had no knowledge of Churchill really at all. In fact, I, I think I can say it without sounding arrogant. It's not meant to be arrogant. I turned the project down initially because I had no interest in Churchill. I then heard that Albert Finney was going to do it, and I begged to be allowed back in. And thank God for um, HBO and, and Frank, because I was allowed another look at it. The opening titles, shot at the end of the movie, not at the beginning, and at a place, I think Frank reminded me, it was called Petworth. There was a big battle between, a big battle, there's always battles, discussions about not having a title sequence and banging straight in with Finney getting out of the car. And I felt you needed to deliver because it was such an amazing image. If we'd come in too fast, I don't think it would have built up to the expectation of seeing Churchill get out of the car. But we shot it on a very misty day. I think we had two days to do all those shots. and old Finney walking up the, the hill. That tree became an important image, didn't it, for us, Frank? Very much so. It's what was used in the poster, I think, in the end, in some places. Also, I think Churchill was so recognizable from his silhouette that the idea yeah. of getting him silhouetted against the sky was very effective. The battle sequence, uh, slow motion. Muskets were quite a problem because I wanted them to be very close together and the, those old muskets, they all fire all sorts of crap out of them and, and hot metal and, and so we had a, quite a problem getting them close together. I wanted to approach the film ultimately like the viewers, so I wanted to judge it based on what was on the page. And I think again the opening of the film was the most extraordinary thing for me because Hugh had created this wonderful sequence where Churchill has this dream, seeing his great ancestor fighting the Battle of Blenheim, which, again, in Churchill's mind, was a very glorious, one of the great moments of English history, and I think also for him encapsulated what the empire was. And then you cut very quickly to Churchill waking up this enormous fat blob in bed, paddling naked, into the bathroom for his morning pee. So within the first five minutes of the film, you just have no idea what's going on. And again, I think what you did, Richard, was to make that battle truly glorious. And the contrast with the morning at Chartwell was very, very strong indeed. Mr. Speaker, will the 30s go down as the decade? Churchill, of course, was famous for stalking around the halls of his various houses naked. He would simply forget where he was and would wander in and out of rooms. And the staff got used to it as his various secretaries. But you never knew when Churchill was going to show up naked. Not the most attractive sight based no. on some of the photographs no. one seen. However, an interesting character detail. Granted, uh, self-government, it would mark the downfall of the British Empire. It will mark and, uh, and consummate the downfall of the British Empire. We were very lucky to get permission to film at Chartwell, which was Churchill's home during this period. We used several rooms there. The study 
where Churchill wakes up, combination study bedroom was completely recreated at Shepparton, but exactly from period photographs at the time. And I think even the, the objects on Churchill's desk from Chartwell were copied, as were the photographs and paintings on the wall. And his bathroom was very much... Bathroom was a complete copy, wasn't it? Yes. Exactly. It was a very small bathroom, minute bathroom. The household was always very chaotic, as you can see. We always have dogs running, people coming and going, to try to create the sense of the madness. Churchill's children came and went, would take up residence at certain time. Usually when they were broken, needed some place to stay. So you never quite knew who was going to be at the house. Ronnie Barker, who plays Inches, which was one of Churchill's various butlers, actually came out of retirement. It's the first time in 14 years he had agreed to do something on camera. That's right, Ronnie had been retired for a long while, a great English comedian, but playing it relatively straight in this. He loves comedy. He was trained as a straight actor, of course. Of course, both Churchill and Inches, his butler, drank a great deal. And apparently there was an ongoing battle on who was drinking whose whiskey and whose scotch. And Churchill also did a lot of work in bed. He would spend most of the mornings in bed writing and then eventually get himself together and go on to his various activities. Because you told her not to come till after lunch, sir. Your invention, I did nothing of the sort. Very disorganized, chaotic, threw his clothes everywhere. A pretty hard man to live with. In fact, one of the reasons that I think Clemmie went off on her little sabbaticals around the world was she'd only take so much of Churchill and then she had to have a bit of a break. This is Churchill. This is Lambert. Good morning, madam. Something the matter. What's wrong? This is the dining room at Chartwell, which was yeah. designed by Churchill when he bought the house and extended it. And it's an extraordinarily contemporary room. Unlike the rest of the house, which is more Elizabethan and Victorian in character, this is quite a fresh-looking room, and I think it was probably inspired by his various trips to Palm Beach, which he took at this period. Mm. It has very much that feel of opening up to the view. I have to say, when I saw Chartwell, the first thing I said, let's not film it, let's film somewhere else. It is so ugly, in my opinion. Beautiful place, beautiful setting, as you know from the movie. You know, Churchill said, I didn't buy the house, I bought the view. But he really did bugger it up. You know, he bought an ugly house and made it uglier. He put this room on, Frank said, but proportions. You can see the windows are about three inches from the ceiling, so it's about 50 feet long, very strange proportions. It is a museum, so filming there was a nightmare. Please, let me wake up first. it? Reminds me that Albert also broke up the language into a kind of phonetics, so he would take any of the dialogue that Hugh wrote for him, and he converted into Churchill phonetics, and he had to have that a few days before. People think that scripts are written months and months, and indeed they should be, but often you're changing stuff as you go along. Albert had to keep very much on his toes to keep the voice tone correct. Truthfully, people think that we just walked into Chartwell. In fact, Chartwell was made up of one room at Chartwell in the exterior. We then filmed at another house for the staircase. We built several bedrooms inside uh, the studio, the bathroom in the studio. Uh, and two other practical locations for... Gardens were somewhere else, weren't they? The drawing room and the kitchens. That's right. They were on another location where we used the real rooms and changed them. So it was a real hodgepodge of imagery to get the style that we got in the film. But it's also was extremely complicated because you always had people on one set walking out of a door, and two months later they'd be walking into the room in a completely different location. The costumes, I was just looking at that um, wonderful dragon dressing gown that we had made for Churchill, which was something I'd seen in a photograph and we couldn't find anyway, so we had to have it made and embroidered. It was cost a fortune, but when you got one shot out of it, it was very good. There you are, Clemmy. Did I keep you waiting? The exterior was Chartwell, which was, again, we thought we couldn't replicate anywhere. Don't you let him boss you about. He's a dreadful boy. Nonsense. Mrs. B adores me. Churchill, of course, was always broke. He lost a lot of money. I think she wants to do it professionally. For him, it encapsulated everything about Churchill, the character, Clemmy and also the relationship together. Then, of course, it ends with this wonderful scene when they go and they take a look at the view from Chartwell. And I think for all of us, it was one of the, the great thrills watching this scene filmed because Albert and Vanessa were so extraordinary together.
There isn't any, sir. That's what I'm telling you, city girl. No, we don't have any cake, Winston. That's what she means. Don't have any cake? Of course we have cake. Dundee cake from Fortnum's. Thank you, Peggy. Yes, ma'am. It reminds me that Albert Albert stayed in character, not in an obnoxious kind of method acting way, but he would he would give me a bollocking if he didn't like something I'd done as Churchill. And I would say something back to him, hopefully not nearly as witty as he was, but I'd give it my best shot. I wanted to see exactly how bad things are. Could be worse, that's the answer. You've got the most enormous energy. He's a great wit, Finney, very funny and sharp man, and a joy to direct. For God's sake, Clemmy, I'm working day and night. All these articles for the evening standard, Marlborough. Not to mention the constituency work. I know, that's why we have to economise. By depriving me of my Dundee cake. They, of course, couldn't play Bezique. It was a very obscure game that the Churchills played, and they studied for weeks. They came to the set thinking they knew it, and, of course, once we started, they lost track completely. I think it was a nightmare editing it. I think everybody had the wrong cards at the wrong time. Completely, but what was interesting, Frank, is that it actually helped the scene because... Albert was getting a little irritated with Vanessa because she was doing very well, but she was getting her cues with the cards wrong. And what it meant was he got tenser and tenser with her, which made her get more and more nervous, as she's meant to be. So it produced a chemistry in the scene that I think is one that makes it one of my favourite scenes. Yes, I think that Vanessa was afraid, as Clemmy was, that Albert was going to bite her head off if she played the wrong card once more. And there's some wonderful ad-libs in this scene, I think, actually, as you say, when he was very irritated that she wasn't playing properly. You knew I didn't like it, and you deliberately deceived me. That's not true. We invited Lady Soames and her son and daughter, and we also took Winston's grandson, Winston, into the editing room, and we actually showed them a scene where Clemmy and Winston look at the view from Chartwell. Much to our satisfaction, we turned around at the end of the scene, all the Churchill family were weeping. So we knew at that point that, at least in terms of Albert and Vanessa... We had gotten it very right indeed. I'm not. Come with me, please. We had a rather ironic situation. Of course, Chartwell has one of the most beautiful views in all of England. That's why I bought it. The day we were shooting, it was completely fogged in. We went back on four different occasions, and we could never get a decent shot of the view from Chartwell. So we ended up having to use a different picture, which we tried to make look like the view at Chartwell. The view from Chartwell is made up from about five different photographs that we stripped a new sky in, foreground was different. We could just never get the view from Chartwell photographed properly, so we had to make it up, sadly. Look at and to cherish for the rest of our lives. I would die for it. This was actually shot at Somerset House. We had permission to shoot the exterior of the Foreign Office and the interior of the Foreign Office. We had reached agreement, I think, last August, and the Foreign Office had given us special permission based on the script. Then, of course, the events of September 11th happened, and suddenly we were denied all permission. So fortunately, we did find some exteriors in London that were very similar. God almighty. Designed for civilian use, I'm told, but we both know they can be used for fight places. This is total madness. In the back of our mind, thought it would have been extraordinary to actually have shot the scenes that took place in the foreign office. It was a great shame, in fact, with an enormous strain on the production to find these new locations. Which reminds me, looking at this location, you can see how there's a grey, dirty colour to this building now. Well, in fact, of course, all the London buildings now have all been cleaned and they're white, basically. I mean, they've got back to new buildings. At that time, they would have been covered in soot from the coal fires and uh, from London for all the London houses. Our effects supervisor, Angus Bickerton, had the task of painting the buildings black because, obviously, at the period that we made the film in, the buildings were all um, black, and, of course, today they've all been cleaned and they're white. And sit there and, in one of his sulks and watch his pigs. Winston. Apples, eating apples. It was a wonderful noise, I thought, the apples. That idea came from being down there and finding an enormous pile of apples from an orchard, and I thought, I wonder if pigs will eat apples. So we, of course they do, and we put them in front of the pigs. So we've got this great, you know, we've got this, the greatest man, in, as it were, in modern contemporary history, perhaps, sitting there, staring at a fat pig eating apples. Pretty incongruous scene. Finally. I found over the years that taking a scene that a writer has, has set in a fairly straightforward environment and then putting it in a slightly different environment 
for example, a love scene that's been written to play against a lake with swans, you know, a romantic scene, a proposal. You take the same dialogue and you put it on a freeway, a motorway, in a rainstorm with a flat, with a puncture, and they're changing the tyre, and they're playing the same scene. It seems often works. It's a cheap trick, but it often works. And I, I did a bit of that in Churchill. Come and have some lunch. Not hungry. Everyone's waiting. Let them wait. He was a mixture of emotions. He could be so rude sometimes and so dismissive, but then he would suddenly run in with a bunch of flowers for one of the girls, or when Mrs P, the secretary portrayed in the film, was very ill, he wrote this beautiful, touching letter to her saying that, you know, she would be looked after and not to worry about anything at all. And yet he could be so brutal at times, a real dichotomy as a human being. What is all this? Report from our air attaché in Berlin. We decided to not use the gardens and the grounds in any close shots at Chartwell because, of course, it's been a National Trust property and is manicured within an inch of its life. And at the time, Churchill had the house. It was a working farm where there was livestock, where there were these vegetable gardens. So we went to find a much more ramshackle, slightly deteriorated working garden and farm area for Chartwell. And as you can see in these scenes here, this is actually a vegetable garden that is still farmed by the owners of the property. And we thought it was much more characteristic of what Chartwell would have looked like at that time than the very manicured set that now exists at the National Trust property. This is one of my favorite moments in the film, simply because I think you've got three of England's greatest actors appearing in this very short scene. Sir Derek Jacobi playing Stanley Baldwin. You have Tom Wilkinson, who was also nominated for an Academy Award last year, and of course Linus Roach. And the fact that both Tom Wilkinson and Derek Jacobi agreed to play these very small parts, I think was only a credit to their desire to work with Richard, but also the strength of the material. Again, it's, it's a great treat for people who admire these men to see them in this really wonderful scene together. Then, of course, the icing on the cake is at the end of the scene, Jim Broadbent appears. Thank you. So this, again, within this five minutes of film, I think you have four of England's greatest actors. Perhaps you will let me know the results of these inquiries. The you also have a slight problem we encountered here in that the German actor on the right, the taller one, talking to Linus, we didn't actually, we cast him, we looked at him, but we didn't know quite how tall he was. He was six feet five. Six feet five, and Linus is about five foot six, no more than that. And so when we actually got them on the day, they looked ridiculous, perhaps, standing on the steps. Linus was staring, I think, at Walter's navel for Just most about. of the scene. So, in fact, optically, that shot, we raised Linus up. When they're on the stairs, it doesn't matter so much because you expect people to be different heights on stairs. But as they walk down to the floor, we actually move Linus up. We make him taller so there wasn't such a marked difference. That was uh, interesting. So for 30 seconds of film, Linus Roach gets to be six foot one. He does, or six foot anyway. <laughs> or the top hat. Yeah. Nothing but bully boys these damn marches. Well, they get away with it, that's the trouble. Nobody does anything about it. That's right, they don't. One of the problems with filming very in these, this was um, uh, the clubs that we've, some of the locations we filmed in were very hard to get permission to do. The famous gentlemen's clubs in London. I'm sorry, have we met before? I'm, I'm terrible at faces. They like a bit of filming, but only in very specific times, so you can't afford to drop behind schedule on location pictures in London if you're using a difficult location. Every day is a nightmare. They also like the crew to show up in a jacket and tie. You had to wear jackets and ties to shoot. Jacket and ties <laughs> to shoot. This scene was actually the first scene that Hugh Whitemore wrote. He said once he had gotten this scene written, he felt that he could write the film. 